Yo, what's up guys? Bill here for Classic Rock and Metal Review. Time to go over the highlights from Japan bootlegs that have come out in the last month. So this will be our May of 2023 edition. I've got 13 things to tell you about. I'll run down a list of 10 of them, followed by three picks of the month from me. Like I said, we're just talking CDs, bootleg CDs coming out of Japan. Titles that I think are worth having, I wouldn't mind having. If I had all the money in the world, I'd, I'd get all of them or most of them for sure. They're all somewhat interesting. We got three Beatles solo titles that look pretty cool. Uh, Bowie, I don't can't see anyone not wanting to have this Bowie. It's pretty awesome. Uh, a couple Jackson Browns that look good. Some Zeppelin. And of course, at the end, one of the picks of the month is Deep Purple, Springfield 1976. Pretty recent bootleg, maybe a month ago this came out. Got a couple good listens to it in the last week. Double CD, do a full review of this guy at the end. Uh, actually like it, don't love it, but still worth having. Only one of only three full-length concerts from the era that, have, that are even out there to be had. So worth having alone for that reason. Um, we'll get into the full review, like I said. So how about we start out with the huge? And that being, I'm pretty excited about tonight's because uh, there's no mincing, no haunted house in it tonight, even though I like that one. Going with some equilibrium here. You guys aren't familiar, you should be. These guys make nothing but great beer. Out of Middleton, New York. You know what, man? I'm in goddamn good mood. Just finished my whole week's worth of work in three days' time which is typical for me. So that's why you see me vanish sometimes through 40 hours in three days. So I don't know if you can read this, but that's how I'm feeling about, about things right about now. And this guy is called Ohm. We've got a triple IPA. No mints in here, no mixing around. 10% ABV. Let's see if I can finally get a pour that'll work instantly or close enough to it. Oh man, just just look at that shit. That's what it's all about, man. All right, I gotta like, all right, I gotta get right into this shit. That's what's going on tonight. You know what, guys? This is gonna be a short episode, so I can get back to that puppy. All right, ten. Bootlegs out of Japan, new releases from the last month. Let's get right to it. Number one, this is a pretty cool looking title. I'm not the biggest fan of this dude, but his older stuff is, is pretty awesome. Billy Joel. Title on this one, Piano Man in Chicago, 1977. I've been seeing some, some interesting stuff out of this. I feel like it's a newer uh, label, Project Zip. It is just a CDR. I think it runs about 17 bucks. Riviera Theater. November 19th, 1977, broadcast on WXRT-FM. I'm assuming they're Chicago. I don't even know. Uh, January 8th of 78, so a couple months after it was recorded, or six weeks or so. Uh, looks like a good, nice little, you know, hour-long or so show. Number two. Now, I'm not a fan of this, these guys, but I know probably some of you are, just because, of course, it's Paige and Paul Rogers. So this is a firm title called Wembley Arena, 1985. Double CD, Silver Press, Soundboard, you know. Uh, whenever I see those things all in a row, I get interested. And, you know, maybe after that Blue Murder CD, you know, I'm going to maybe maybe at some point check this out down the road. But not right away for sure. This is a gig from May 22nd. So actually, you know, almost an anniversary for that a couple days from now. War Doors, your label, they do some pretty cool stuff. A lot of silver presses from them, if not all. Uh, London show, obviously, Wembley Arena. So this is a cool-looking title uh, if you're a fan of the firm. I'm not, honestly. I have mean business back on the shelf. I still haven't heard. I picked it up a year ago. Uh, I'm not a big fan of their first album in the first place. I used to have Hammersmith video. I uh, couldn't get into that either. So, But I'm sure some of you are interested in this firm title. Ah, yes. Equilibrium has not been in my life enough lately. Here's a kind of cool title from The Police. 
It's called The Derangements, unreleased remixes, again from the Project Zip label. Seven songs remixed or reinterpreted, you know, by Stuart Copeland. Uh, the description that comes with the CD, it's printed right on the back label there. Word is that you were to be used as bonus tracks on police reissues. But also done around the time of Stewart's documentary on the police called Everyone Stares, which I think goes back to 2006. So soundboard quality on these seven, you know, remixes, I guess is all they really are of older police songs. Kind of an interesting title, you know. Wouldn't mind hearing it. I don't think I need to own it. Number four, Rolling Stones European Tour 1973. A couple of these shows, I think three different cities were broadcast as King Biscuit Flower Hour shows. And also there were rebroadcasts in 74 and then again in 88. So this is sort of a collection of them pieced back together to put the set list back in order sort of thing. So, you know, there's not a ton of Stones in the way of like uh, soundboard quality stuff from the 70s. So that's why this is kind of interesting. However, the set list doesn't have enough deep cuts on there for me to be interested in. Only a couple, Dancing with Mr. D, uh, a couple from uh, Exile. Number five, this is a cool looking title. David Bowie, it's called Bowieing Out. I guess it's supposed to be a play on words for bowing out. Final Ziggy Stardust show. The label here is called The Archives, Unlimited. Comes with an Obi. It's two CDs, silver presses. Uh, so what they did here was take various sources of his final show as Ziggy Stardust and meld them together to try to get the full show. I don't know if it is the full show, but it's the closest thing to it that's come out so far. And this is a long ass show. I mean, look at all the songs on this bad boy. A lot of material. So this is being done for the 50th anniversary. What they've also said, they've taken some clips from, uh, I think, official release. Uh, the movie that I don't think necessarily all those songs made it on the soundtrack. The movie had some sources in mono. They're now converted to stereo. Some new soundboard material is on here too. So the claim, like I said, being the fullest version of the final show with David Bowie as Ziggy. All right, number six, John Lennon, Walls and Bridges, alternate mixes, Beat Files, the label, uh, new remix of the album, which I think is his best album. This is a great one. And some alternate mixes to follow. A lot of versions of, I think it's whatever gets you through the night where they just narrow down, you know, isolate some tracks. Not too into that, but I wouldn't mind hearing what a remix of the regular album sounds. And a couple of those bonus tracks look cool too. Keeping with Beatles solo, George Harrison, Cloud Nine, Mixing Desk. Three CDs with this, Obi. Mr. Claudel is the name of this label. I don't think I heard of those before. Silver Press, like I said, three CDs. Comes with the, uh, like I said, the Obi. All soundboard, obviously, is 1987 album. So all 11 tracks from the album broken down into various individual isolated tracks. And I think the song Cheer Down's on there too that would be on a compilation and soundtrack a few years later. So that's sort of your bonus track. Paul McCartney, Venus and Mars, and more. Moonchild's the label on this. Moonchild, if you're not familiar, a label that sort of does budget silver press CDs. So you're getting your, and they try to focus on soundboards. They do some audience stuff too. These are obviously all soundboard quality from his, I think it's a 75 album, Venus and Mars. Various edits, alternate mixes, outtakes, etc., from Venus and Mars sessions. Uh, that took place between November of 74 and February of 75. Very cool. For $25 for three silver press CDs, pretty good bargain here. This will probably be one of those that sell out pretty quick. Uh, I have multiple Moonchild titles back up on that wall. You know, there's fancier versions. Their artwork's minimal, but they do give you silver press CDs that sound pretty great. All right, number nine. Michael Schenker Group, Frankfurt 1991, An Acoustic Evening with MSG. This is actually a CD-DVD combo. Uh, it's on the Shades label. The CD is a CDR, but it's soundboard. The DVD is a DVDR, but also pro shot. It's actually from a TV broadcast. So 
FM broadcast, TV broadcast combo here uh, from the Music Hall in Frankfurt, Germany. This was an acoustic tour he did, so just part of it right here. I'm sure this is pretty cool, you know. All right, on to some, one more title before we get to our recommendations. Jackson Brown, Lennox, 1990 soundboard. This was an acoustic trio setup, which, you know, it's two CDs, it's soundboard, uh, Zion's the label. Really cool set list. There's some songs on here he, he hadn't done in years. Stuff from the first album and stuff. Uh, the reason I wore this Graham Nash shirt was, you know, this sort of arrangement with percussion vocalist, guitarist vocalist, and then Jackson Brown doing piano and guitar and vocals, obviously. Um, I probably wouldn't have been that interested in this normally, but Graham Nash had this set up last summer when I saw him in concert. And it really is awesome. You know, it's kind of like one of those things where maybe at first you think, oh, there's no full band here. It's not going to be worth or as great as it could be. It's an interesting kind of setup. You know, I wouldn't mind hearing this one. Now on to three recommendations of the month. Jackson Brown again. This one I do like, not just because it's full band, but because it's 1986. Hamburg, 1986, Soundboard Masters, the full title. Again with Project Zip. Two CDs, these might be CDRs. I didn't write that down, I should have. Um, the gig is from November 2nd, 1986. Now Jackson Brown, somebody I have a handful of his 70s albums. I used to have Hold Out on cassette, that's gone. Uh, I do have the Fast Times of Ridgemont High soundtrack, but there's a bunch of his early 80s stuff on here, which is, I, I love that stuff. I gotta get some of those albums. You know, I have like a best of that has some of these songs, but he does In the Shape of a Heart, That Girl Can Sing, uh, On the Boulevard, a lot of good stuff like that. Somebody's Baby's on there. Uh, so this title looks good to me. I think I actually watched, there might be a DVD of this show or another 86 show that's pro shot that's on YouTube that I watched a while back. And pretty cool stuff. So this, was a, this would be a title I'd be interested in for all the reasons I just stated. All right, some Zeppelin. Speaking of Moonchild CDs, you know, when I saw this one coming out, this is a different label. Wendy's the label. It's called The Thundering Herd Multiband Remaster. Two CDs with Obi Strip. Fort Worth, Texas Soundboard, uh, May 19th, 73. You get three bonus tracks from January 73 in the, in the UK. But I was actually considering buying this. And then I thought, maybe, I think this rings a bell. Let me go see. So I ordered this thing like six months ago. Moonchild version, like I was telling you about. I think I paid like 22 bucks for this. It's two discs, they're on uh, silver press CDs. So, you know, minimal artwork with, artwork with Moonchild. You know, every CD seems to have the same font and all as far as the text on the back. You know, nothing great with artwork, but they're silver presses and I'm sure they could probably be snagging the same sources as your fancier labels. But, you know, if I didn't have this already, this, this Wendy label release looks pretty awesome. So that's your second recommendation. Last one for the month, guys. You know, I'll go in, I'll, I'll recommend this guy even though, you know, it's not the best thing since sliced bread. So we'll go over it all. But I still like it because I really like this era of the band. The Purple, Springfield 1976, double CD. Let's do some review action and then we'll get ourselves into all the artwork. But here's a little sneak peek on the inside of what you're going to be looking at. Guys, this is a double CD on the Darker Than Blue label, Silver Press. It's from January 26, 1976, Springfield, Massachusetts. Now guys, this, what makes this a very notable title, I noticed it was the best seller on Disc Japan last week. Third, it's only the third full length album, live album from the Tommy Bowen era, which of course is 75 to 76. Long Beach, California, King Biscuit Flower Hour, that's one of the shows. Tokyo 75, which on CD was called This Time Around. First came out on vinyl, there it is back there. Last concert in Japan. 10 songs on this guy, and I think the CD was the full show. 
Now, the California Long Beach show had three bonus tracks from here. So they were, they've been out for years, so there's always been speculation that this whole show existed, and finally we get it, soundboard quality and all. So that's pretty cool. Let's just backtrack a little bit and talk about Purple. How do we get to Mark IV? Well, tensions rise, come to a head with Ian Gillen sparring and you know, button heads with Richie. That's back in 73. The Who Do We Think We Are album, I think, is pretty, pretty pedestrian. The tour reviews from that, pretty much the same. So by 74, Gillen and Roger, Roger Glover leave the band. David Coverdale comes in on vocals. Glenn Hughes also vocals, but he also plays bass. He's from Trapeze. Coverdale was an unknown from, you know, unsigned uh, band, you know. So they do the Burn album. Of course, that sort of reestablishes the band. Some people think Burn's their best, you know. The Cal Jam performance which I think was one of Coverdale's first, is amazing. You know, I think it's one of the best concert videos out there. That's also April of 74. Uh, later in 74, the band does another album. Now this one, uh, we get less Blackmore input, more input by Coverdale and Hughes. And Blackmore wasn't totally into it. They do the album together though, Stormbringer. Great title track. A lot of the other rest of the record, you can pretty much say is sort of like soulful rock maybe some blues in there with Richie's playing but it's kind of like a soul rock record in a way um, not for Richie so he leaves after that after that tour in 75 so in 75 Deep Purple the remaining guys decide to keep it going with Tommy Bolin formerly of Zephyr and the James Gang had some solo albums that he was, I think he was working on one when he was asked to join Purple, and that came out while he was in Purple, as did his second solo album. The solo albums are kind of like jazz fusion, some rock, some blues, but jazz fusion he kind of is known for. So, guys, I want to tell you a little bit, you know, how I got into this era, which really wasn't until fairly recently, maybe 10 years ago. I had a... Uh, VHS back in the 90s, like 91, I think when it came out. Heavy Metal Pioneers. It was just a documentary, one hour you could buy on video that covered the whole whole history of the band. And they really brushed over the whole Mark IV era, you know. So that always was stuck in my head like, I need to know more about that era. I was interested in knowing more at some point. So I came across this guy about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago just happened to come out right as I was you know cruising through a record store Phoenix Rising it's called it is a DVD full-length documentary 80 minutes that focuses just pretty much only on the Mark IV era so 75 to 76 era they brush over what I just told you about Richie leaving and Stormbringer and stuff like that so it kind of just focuses really on Tommy Bowen's era of the band which is really cool Guys, this is hands down my favorite rock documentary of all time. I've watched it four or five times. Uh, I watched it twice within the first couple weeks I got it. It's so, some just such incredible shit went on with this, with this band. They actually had a roadie murdered by a foreign government in one of the countries they went to play concert in. And to make matters worse, they were kind of held hostage to play another show before they left the country that they weren't paid for. I mean, it was just crazy. They went on to play a gig with Tommy Bowen, who unfortunately had some drug issues, as most of you already know. And he slept on his arm for like an eight or 10 hour flight to Japan. They played the show. Unfortunately, that was videotaped. You know, it's that 30 minute concert called Rises Over Japan is part of this uh, video. And, you know, it's just hard to watch a guitar player who can't really play guitar on stage. Uh, but that's just another one of the crazy things that happen on here. But so if you want to know about this era of the band, this is the video. I mean, it's mostly just John Lord and Glenn Hughes being interviewed, but there's some older interview clips of Pace, Bolin, and Coverdale from the era. Uh, sort of describing how crazy shit got. Unfortunately, the drug use also with Glenn Hughes 
became like a cocaine addict at the time. And he fully admits it right here on this, you know, in this video. Now, John Lord's on this video saying that, you know, even though a lot of, a lot of guys did drugs and whatever else back then, that there weren't very many people that took it to, to the stage. Glenn Hughes was one of them and Tommy Bowen another. We got to see the video evidence on Rises Over Japan video, obviously, but unfortunately, I think I can only assume we're hearing it again here, you know, unfortunately. Because one of the reasons when I got this that I really wanted to hear it was the only concert stuff I have uh, or was super familiar with was the Rises Over Japan video from watching this thing like five times. And, you know, it was like, oh, good. I can't wait to see what it's, what he's like. I've heard so much about Tommy Bowen. I can't wait to hear him without a numb hand, you know. So that just sets you up for how I went into this CD. Guys, so much of this show can just be described the same way. That it's really pointless to critique each song. All right. So I'm just going to give you an overall sort of uh, critique, I guess, review. The overall sounds really good. It's soundboard, like I mentioned. There's like one quick tape pause somewhere along the way, I forget, but it's super quick. It only sounds like a second or two were missed. The intro can be a little rough into the beginning of Burn. There's a little like that tape warble going on for 30 seconds and things settle down and then that's not an issue anymore. The, so the overall sound can be a little bassy and a little flat in spots, but overall it's pretty damn good. Performance-wise, David Coverdale sounds great, okay? I mean, I'm not even a huge Whitesnake fan, but, you know, I like him. Uh, Coverdale's voice is awesome. Just one of those lucky guys. He's got an awesome voice. Lord and Pace, they both sound solid here. Of course, they're amazing players. They both sound very good. If anything, they sound maybe a little uninspired here. And we'll get to the reasons why shortly. At least I'm assuming why, but Glenn Hughes. His bass playing here is like really good. Solid, really good. His vocals are good and not too much of that high-pitched squeal and shit. Uh, one or two times, but not too bad. A couple of notes are bordering on being out of tune or bad notes, but it's like he bows out right before they turn bad kind of thing. So overall, you're not going to get too much of that Glenn Hughes that, that can be annoying. He's good here overall. He has one moment towards the end of the show. Uh, Coverdale's doing like his little sort of Robert Plant-esque, you know, baby, baby kind of thing. And Glenn chimes in, well, my baby comes, tell her to bring cocaine. <laughs> like he literally says that to the crowd. A little tacky, you know, but overall, Glenn Hughes sounds good. So the whole band up till here sounds good. Guys, no disrespect to Tommy Bowen. I don't have his solo albums. I don't have any Zephyr. I was unimpressed by James Gang Miami, but not because of the guitar playing specifically. It just wasn't in that album. So I actually got rid of it. You know, I played it four times and didn't like it. So that's enough for me. There is some sound issues with his equipment here and there too. So I'm not going to hold that against him, obviously. And it doesn't really, you know, it's a little annoying, I have to admit. You don't usually hear that many sort of instrument situations going on, but each of them only last a minute. So we got a concert here that's almost two hours or so. You know, three or four minutes of instrument, you know, amp issues is not what I'm talking about here when I say that the playing here on guitar is very unimpressive. I already told you about Rises Over Japan is what the original video was called. It's a 30 minute concert from Japan where Bolin is playing with a hand basically stuck in this position. You can only see him move one finger once in a while. Uh, and, you know, so basically that was a side effect of drugs. Now, I think Lord's on there saying a doctor gave him a shot to sleep. He, most, I also heard a story where he basically just overdosed, like semi-overdosed and fell asleep on his arm. Nevertheless, the guy had whatever issue going on and had a numb hand and played a concert. So it's hard to watch that Rises Over Japan video. So like I said, this is one of the things, one of the reasons why I was really looking forward to this was to hear Tommy Bowen do what a lot of people say he can do. Which I have yet to hear, you know. 
Although I shouldn't really say that the CD on here with half Long Beach, half Japan. This is a CD DVD, by the way. The CD on here has four songs from each of those places. And that sounds pretty good, although not in, super impressive with that either. Anyway, it's honestly, the playing on here is, it's almost as bad as that Japan video. I just got to call it like it is, guys. It's, it, you know, I mostly come on here and gush about everything I buy because I love it. I can't love the guitar playing on here. The CD overall, it's good. But I just got to run down why I'm saying Boland's pretty lousy here. Now, there's some really good guitar playing. There are three or four, maybe five little bursts of 10 to 20 seconds of great guitar playing on here. But we're talking about a two hour concert again, guys, you know. He doesn't have a numb hand excuse, all right? And actually, those four or five great bursts might even make this harder to it's kind of, it makes it even, it's such a frustrating listen, basically. Because if this guy's able to play good for four or five times for 30 seconds, then why is so much of this CD so lacking in guitar? It's just really tough. He rarely plays more than, even though, like I said, he has his bursts of great guitar playing, he rarely plays more than a handful of notes as a riff. Two or three notes. Do 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 do. And he just plays them over and over and over and over again. Sometimes ten or twenty times. It's like, you know, have you ever heard of, you heard the expression, someone really knows their way around the guitar? Well, this guy doesn't. You know, on this show, he sticks with one riff. It's almost like he can play that riff, so he just stays on that riff because he doesn't want to take a chance of moving his hand. I don't even know how to describe it, guys. Uh, he's badly out of key playing slide guitar in two different spots. His 10 minute solo is the worst I've ever heard in my life. It's, it's four minutes of Star Wars space effects that anyone could do on a guitar with the right pedals. You know, I mean, I'd rather watch Jar Jar Binks play guitar than this, okay? And once he's done the space effects, it's a lot of silence. Then he's trying to play slide again and it's out of key. I mean, some of it's in key, but some of it's out of key. It's just bad, man. And it's, I don't know why the band even let him have this guitar solo slot. Or they, at the very least, should have judged whether he was on that night and just removed the solo if he wasn't. I mean, this is all hindsight and conjecture on my part. I know, but I just got to call the performance like it is. Uh, I really haven't heard, I don't think ever heard such a bad guitar performance in my life. And that might even include the Japan video that he's on where his hand is numb. It's so bad I need a drink. Guys, there, there are also a number of spots where the band just sits in a pocket, grooving. It's just waiting for him to do something. And he chooses to do nothing most of the time. I mean, some minor playing. Now, maybe some of that is he's having amp issues. Maybe he's playing and he can't hear him. But there are other times where you do hear him. He's just not playing anything of note. Uh, very frustrating listen, guys, is, is what I got to say. Because we're listening to basically a super group here. Five fantastic musicians. Four of which might not sound like they're doing their best performance ever. Uh, Coverdale sounds great. He's on the top of his game. The other three guys sound really good and really solid, okay? No disrespect to Tommy Bowen, but this is just mediocre guitar playing, and that's being generous. So this, is, this, this CD is a good guitar player away from being great. Now, the songs on here, I love them. Come Taste the Band is a great album. A lot of it's on here. They do the Machine Head stuff pretty damn good too. There's a couple, I think there's a couple of Bolin songs, solo songs on here too. That sounds good. Uh, this could have been an excellent, excellent album with, with some even just good guitar playing. To me, it's very good because I just love this Come Taste the Band material so much. 
but unfortunately I can't go all the way and say it's excellent. I'm still gonna recommend it because I just love this era of purple. And like I said, it's only the third full on release. So you've seen the cover, here's the inlay card, tray card, nice job here. Darker than blue's the label, like I said. Here's the numbered sticker, just loves the fallout. Again, you know, I ordered this when it was like a new release and yet 295 always in the 200s no matter what it's ridiculous i don't buy that sticker for one damn minute i think i already showed you the cd itself this is disc one both discs look the same cool i like that shot of the band that's some cool shit there dig it like i said disc two the same you get your double cd flip job Cool picture in the back of the band. I hadn't seen that band before, or band shot before. And I've already showed you the back before, but there it is one more time. And uh, guys, we're going to be going over this Phoenix Rising video on our concert video segment coming up soon. This is fantastic. You should see the stuff that you not only get the DVD documentary, has the concert on there, has some bonus stuff. You get two different booklets with it. I'm just showing you the one there. There's another one behind it. Fantastic. $23 I think I spent on this thing. $25. 10 or 12 years ago. Guys, that's going to do it for now. If you can like it, subscribe. That would be awesome. We just talk about cool shit and we drink good beer. Sometimes cocktails. I recommend if you like Sabbath, look on our last episode. I got a Black Sabbath cocktail recipe coming up. We're going to all... Hoist that bad boy while we listen to Live Evil for the first time. Or at least review it coming up. Guys, I appreciate it if you like and subscribe. That would be all for now. Guys, I'll catch you soon enough. Cheers.